Amen. What a beautiful sight to watch the disciple-making ministry and the little ones, some of which have my DNA in them, being built up in the Lord. What a blessing. What a blessing. I'm going to ask you to pray with me as well as we begin this morning. We're going to have a very special time this morning, and I'm just going to ask the Lord to help to prepare our hearts. Lord Jesus, I come to you now and I ask you, Lord, to please take all of the distractions, all of the worries of the day, anything that would interfere with us hearing you and embracing what you would have for each one of us here today. I ask you, Lord, to supernaturally put it down. Don't allow the enemy to distract or discourage anybody within the sound of my voice, I pray. I ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, let me ask you a question this morning. What would you say is special about today and what might you have heard that has been misleading to you in the last day, week, month, year? What's special about today, and what might you have heard that is misleading or perhaps has misrepresented God's intention for you in the last day, week, month, year? And does that matter? Do those two questions matter? I will tell you from my perspective, uh, today is a special day because this is the day that would have been the celebration of my mother's birthday. Uh, I celebrated my 49th birthday this week. And today, had she, not, had she not died 46 years ago, this would have been a day of celebration. I would have celebrated my mother's birthday, my children would have celebrated their grandmother's birthday. So it has, a very special ring to it in terms of the day. Now the other question may, may seem unrelated to you. What have you heard that was misleading to you? Um, that ties in very closely because you see, I have often asked myself, Lord, what, what did my mother misunderstand? What, what didn't she get? Because I was told that she went to church. I was told that she had a churched background. I don't know my mother's final fate. I don't know where she is right now. But I can tell you that I've spent a lot of time in my life wondering two things. What didn't she get because she was involved in her own death? And or what did the people around her not get that claimed Christ? And you know, Obviously, that some of those are answers that I may never know, even on the other side of eternity. But I know that it matters what you understand God to say. I know it matters every day who you understand God to be and how you embrace or reject his word and how carefully you approach him and his word. I've devoted my life to championing that cause. You say, well, you're a pastor. I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ, and I have the privilege of being your pastor. And in that definition is to champion the truth and the love of the one true God as given through his inspired holy word. And I pray that you will embrace that same call. You see, you don't need to be a pastor to be a follower of Jesus. And this is what all of us have been called to be. And this morning, as we continue with our series called The Walk of God, as we systematically continue to walk through the Gospel of John, we find ourselves three verses from the very end of the Gospel. And once again, we will focus on one verse. John chapter 21, verse 23. And I pray that you will join me in seeing that God is making a point while teaching a principle that ties back to my first two questions. 
You see, the point is going to be singular. The principle is going to be eternal. And it ties back in to this question of how important is it that you truly listen carefully to God and his word? And how important is it that you get it right when you think that you know God and his word? And I will tell you from personal experience as one who has lived without a mother and as a pastor who's been called and equipped by God to equip you that this is eternally important and it's not just a matter of practicalities or quality of life. And so I'm gonna ask you to walk with me this morning in a way that I pray will inform your walk for the rest of your life and equip you to equip others to walk this same walk with God per his descriptions and per his priorities as given to us in his word. So I ask you this morning, if you would, to read with me, if you have your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 21. And let me begin in verse 21, just to bring us back into the context of verse 23. God's word says, the gospel of John chapter 21, verses 21 through 23. So Peter, seeing him, the apostle John, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Now let me just remind you in terms of context. Jesus has gone to the cross and he's risen. We've seen the miraculous account and sightings of Jesus, one from Mary Magdalene on the other side of the grave, then the disciples and even Thomas gets his special visit. And then we come into the great commission through John's gospel where Jesus says to them, listen, as the Father has sent me, now I send you, go. And we come into chapter 21 and the focus now becomes Jesus through the life lesson of Peter. And I just remind you that Peter was restored. Remember Peter who denied Christ three times, once even in front of a little girl, is restored. Jesus brings him back into the ministry. Peter's not only restored, he's reminded what that means. You are to go and feed and lead my sheep no matter what. And you will be crucified in the process and that doesn't change a thing. You come follow me. And then last week in verses 21 and 22, we see not only has Peter now been restored and reminded, he's actually rebuked. Hey, what is that to you? Our language, Jesus said, hey, Peter, mind your own business and follow me. It's about obedience. Stop worrying about other people and you do what you know to do. You follow me. Well, that's what brings us to verse 23 this morning. And here's what God says. Now, you're gonna see that God gives us a little commentary here. Verse 23 is a commentary on verses 21 and 22. Because of this, because of Jesus just rebuking Peter and saying, hey, listen, don't you worry about him, follow me. Because of this, the rumor, the rumor spread among the brothers, among the believers. Three different Greek words here. Rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. That's the rumor. The rumor that spread was, hey, did you hear? John's not going to die. But Jesus did not say that. Please hear that. But Jesus did not say that. He did not say that he would not die. He only said, quote, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? I ask you, friends, is it important that you not succumb or be a part of rumors? I ask you, friends, is it important that you not succumb or be a part of the spreading of rumors? I ask you, friends, have you come to realize the fact that that doesn't just happen outside the body of Christ, but that rumors can be spread 
amongst the believers? And do you realize that the rumors that can be spread amongst the believers is not in line with what Jesus said? This is a reality that must be embraced in order for the body of Christ to be healthy. And I say to you that this is a cancer that plagues far too many churches. This is a stain on the bridal gown of Christ's bride far too often. What is the response? Does this really matter? Maybe that's the first question. Does this really matter? I tell you that all you have to do is look at those words to realize, oh, it matters. And again, we're at the third verse from the end of the Gospel of John. Don't lose sight of the fact that God is making a point here. He's making a strong point right at the end of the message. So does it really matter? I would say to you that all you have to do is take a walk through the Bible and you will see, oh, it matters whether or not you hear God correctly, you dispel any misrepresentation of him or his ways, and that you not, not be a part of anything that would spread something outside of what God has truly said. Say, okay, Pastor Jeff, what do you, you know, can you, can you back that up? Let me ask you, do you think it was important that Adam and Eve doubted what God said? First introduction, the birthplace of sin, John, uh, Genesis 3. Did God really say? Let me ask you about Noah. Do you think it was important that he actually believed what God, really, Lord, an ark? (laughs) It's never even rained. An ark, really? Really? Was it important that he took the details down? Was it important that God told Lot's wife not to look? I mean, really, what's, in, what's the harm in looking? Pillar of salt harm, I'll tell you that. Is it important that you truly understand what God said and that you take it in its proper context and you apply and obey all of it? How about Moses? Really, you want me to go to the Pharaoh and tell him to just let the people go? (laughs) I can't do that. You better. I'm supposed to tell him about these plagues? That's crazy. You better. I'm supposed to actually say that these are the rules of God? Yeah. You mean I'm supposed to tell them that we're actually ready to go into the promised land? Look, but Lord, I just got word. We have eyewitness account. There are giants over there. Yeah, you better. Well, they, they're not giving me a lot of credibility because they're saying, hey, how, how in the world did we get here anyway? Have you looked at the map? You don't get to the edge of the border of the promised land the way you took us. The most expeditious way would have been this way. Why did you take us that way? Because God said so. Do you think it was important that Moses led them on the path and the directions and the route that God told him. Hey, you don't back us up against the Red Sea, knucklehead. No, this is what God said. Do you think it was important that Moses told them the truth and adhered to what God said as he said it? Just look at those that rejected 40 years in the desert. How about Joshua? Really, Lord, You, you want me to march us around the city you want, you want us to go into battle and have the worship team lead us? C- come on, Lord. You can't be serious. Oh, I'm, I'm deadly serious. You think it was important that they listened to and followed what the Lord said? I mean, just, just walk through the Bible. Every place where you see God's blessing, you will see faithful obedience to what God really said. And every time that you see God's wrath or curse or sin or brokenness or stain, it will follow disobedience. It will follow some perverted understanding or lack of understanding or intentional deception to what God really said. And this plays out even today, right? I mean, look in the New Testament. 
All you've got to do is look at Peter. You pervert what he says, you get a pope. Look at what he says and get it wrong about the body of Christ and you get the doctrine of uh, transubstantiation where you believe that the bread and the wine are literally the physical body of Christ and the blood of Christ. It's wrong. It does great damage. Right? Read Revelation 2 and 3 and see what happens to the churches that lose their commitment to God and his word. It's a horrific picture of reality. It matters. Right? Revelation 22, 18. Don't you dare add or subtract from this word or the wrath that's foretold in it will become yours. You think that matters? This is huge, friends. This is huge. That you not become a part of a rumor. And not all rumors are poisonous. Listen, you've got to understand that good intentions does not bring credibility. That you can be sincerely wrong. It doesn't have to do with you. The, the, the test of truth-telling is not in the teller, it's in the truth. The test of truth-telling is not in the teller, it's in the truth. I offer you this morning what I pray is not just an awareness of the problem, but a walk through God's word in such a way that I pray will offer to you the answer to the problem, the solution. You see, if you want to ensure that you will not be a part of the rumors that get spread amongst the body that are not in line with what Jesus really said or meant, the key is to become a child of God and a student of God's word. This is why we as a people are so committed to being people of the word that we find in our identification and in our definition that it's to be God's chosen people who are committed to walk with him as his ambassadors through his descriptions and definitions in his word. I mean, let me just ask you, what, what have you heard that either perverts God's word and is widely accepted or perhaps misrepresents God's word? I'll tell you two, two quotes that are perhaps amongst the most common. God helps those who help themselves. That's in the Bible. No, it isn't. Right? How about this? God works all things together for good. That's in there, but that's not the point, and it's not the message. God is working all things together for the good, comma, for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Do you see how things can get so easily twisted? So the answer for you and me is what we are actually sharing right now as a church with our new budding ministry in Kampala, Uganda. You see, if somebody doesn't know Jesus from a jelly bean, doesn't have a clue about the difference between Christianity and karma, you and I have been called as believers to help such people to come to know Christ and his ways in a way that is personal, powerful, and pervasive, that it will spread. And so what I've prepared for you this morning and for us together is what you would want to be able to understand and to share if your intention was to develop a biblical world view. You see, this is the answer. You and I have got to, as believers, you and I have got to tame our tongue and train our ears. This is the essence of living with a biblical worldview. It is to tame our tongue and train our ears to speak and hear with a consistency to Christ and Christ's likeness as evidenced by the validity of his word. And so I say to you, there is a three-legged stool that all of us need as believers. And that is we need to learn God's word and ways. We need to love God's word and ways. We need to live God's word and ways. Herein, you and I will find 
that biblical worldview that addresses the challenges and the cancers that come from the rumors that can be spread even amongst the people of God that show themselves to not be in line with what Christ and God and his word have really said. And so I offer this to you as one person's attempt to build a biblical worldview on the pillars of scripture. And in much the same way that we did when we looked at what I call the stick man gospel, I do not say to you that this is the only way that encapsulates a biblical worldview, but I offer it to you as mine. And I say to you, please take it, share it, build upon it, morph your own, find your own biblical verses if mine don't meet your fancy but find those that will help you to truly understand and to share with others. This is what you need to learn. Here are the essentials that you need to know because if you don't know the truth, it doesn't matter how sincerely you're attached to what you think is the truth, you're wrong. There are certain non-negotiables that need to be learned and understood. There are aspects to love, not lust, not like, not lukewarmness, but biblical love that must be understood to have a healthy relationship with God and with others. And there are some very real biblical guiding principles on how you and I are to live as evidence of this fruited life that's connected to the root of Christ. So let me just give you, in in large part, what those verses are. And I tell you that I'm about to share 58 passages with you. And I do that in direct parallel to Isaiah 58. And I would encourage you this week to read Isaiah 58. In fact, go through the first 13 verses of Isaiah 59 and you will see a beautiful portrait of the essence of this message and who we are called to be. But we will look at 28 passages under the umbrella of learning. I'm sorry, 22 under learning. We'll look at 10 under loving and we'll look at 26 under living. And again, I'm gonna give them to you and I promise you in the notes, because you can't possibly take all this in, but in the notes that are available to you online, all of this is there for your future digestion and sharing. So please, if you would, this morning, just, just sit and let God's word cascade over you. And I pray in large part, help to cleanse and refine you and encourage and build you up. So with that said, I tell you, Matthew Matthew Henry said that the the challenge to this type of message and the truths that I'm about to share is that we are so quick to believe that which we want to believe, but we have in our flesh and in a fallen world a tendency to push away the truths of God that tend to refine us and call us to change. But let me just again remind you that the essence of Christianity is change. Change that we are perpetually being changed into greater Christ-likeness, all for his glory and all by his grace. If you don't want to change, you don't really want Christ. Because to say that I don't want to change is to say that I'm good enough. And to say that I'm good enough before the Christ who hung on the cross for you is blasphemy. So I encourage you to embrace the call to be changed and that we do this together. This is the essence of being the church. So let's take a look at those things that we need to learn. I tell you up front, go to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 and learn that God's word is the authority to be had. If you choose to reject that, you're going to go ahead and make yourself or some other entity the authority in and over your life. And I promise you to take that throne away from God is to put yourself adrift into the abyss of lostness. Take a look at Genesis 1.1 and John 1.1. Here you'll find not only creator God, but creator Christ. You'll see that they are one and the same. You disengage these two and you'll have an unhealthy understanding of God as creator. You'll drift into evolution and its ills. And you'll also lose sight of Christ as the creator God. And you'll likely have him in a bad, unhealthy, basically wrong understanding. Take a look at Matthew 3, 16 and 17 to see the evidence of the Trinity. There are those that are part of what's called a oneness movement that don't believe that there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
three persons in the Godhead. But if you read this account at the baptism of Jesus, you'll see that it's Jesus the Son being baptized, the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove, and God the Father speaking his pleasure. You see the Trinity evidenced right here. Go to Genesis 3 and John 3. Here you'll find the reality of sin and salvation. Without understanding Genesis 3 and John 3, you'll likely think that people are basically good and that the problems of the world can be solved through inner effort and personal uh, endeavors. You won't realize, as seen in John 3, that the only hope of the world is to be born again and that until that happens, the wrath of God remains, remains on those. The default position is to be lost in our sin. Go to John 14, 6 to get a right view of Christ and to recognize that he is the only way. If you don't embrace this verse or get it right, you will be one of those who thinks that there are many ways up the mountain to God. You will reject the exclusivity of the gospel. You may look and sound good, but you will be lost in leading others astray as well if you reject the truth and the challenge of John 14, 6. Read Matthew 5, 17 to understand that there is no cheap grace, that Jesus did not come to abolish the standards of God. He came to fulfill them and that you cannot simply say, as many do, well, that's why we have grace. That's why Jesus died. This isn't that big a deal. In the old days, they called them libertines. Today, we call it cheap grace. Take a look at the Roman road. If you don't understand the true path of salvation, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Praise God, but Romans 5.8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You wouldn't know there were hope. There was hope. If you reject that, you wouldn't realize that in Romans 6.23, that the wages of that rejection is death in your sin. As you go forward, you wouldn't realize in Romans 10.9 that it's a matter of the heart. Confess and believe. Repent and believe. Romans 12, 1, you've missed that and you'll lose sight of the fact that your and my act of true worship is to be living sacrifices, right? You reject these truths and all of a sudden you concoct some kind of social religion where you're not really a Christ follower, but you can be a good churchgoer and you think, well, hey, that's fine. It's all the same, right? No, that's wrong. These are important issues. These are in part the rumors that may not necessarily be evil in their intent, but they're eternal in their impact. Take a look at Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5, where God makes it clear that he knew Jeremiah and appointed him while he was still in his mother's womb. Stephanie and Eric are awaiting the arrival of their son. God knows him already. God has a plan for him already. God has appointed a plan Now you say, that's great for Jeremiah. Well, let me tell you, you reject that verse and you'll embrace abortion. And you'll say that that's a choice instead of a child. And that's wrong. Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5 says that every life has God's fingerprint and plan on them, even in the womb. Take a look at Romans 10, 17. It answers the question of where and how faith is to be given. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Say, okay, that's good news. Well, let me just tell you, if you reject that, you don't embrace that, you're going to try to work somebody into salvation. You'll be thinking, oh, if we could just do a little bit, if we could get a little better bait on the hook, I tell you, they're so close, we could just push them in. No, you can't. We can't. It's impossible for us to bring or bait anybody into faith, into saving faith. It's by sharing the word of God. This is why a message like today is so important. This is why the theme and the the personality of our ministry here is so steadfast to being those who embrace, live, apply, and share God's word. It's the only hope of changing a heart. The Holy Spirit does it, and he does it predominantly through the sharing of his word. Take a look at John 8, 31 through 36. In particular, verses 32 and 36, what you'll find is that it is the truth that will set you free and that once you have been set free, you're free indeed. Now that's critical because until you realize it, you'll play with other things besides the truth and you'll think that you can be reshackled and that you can lose your salvation. Well, the promises of God here is that once you are set free, you are free and free indeed. Well, this is the difference between hope and despair. 
between confidence and a crushing weight. Praise God. It's critically important that we get this right. Take a look at Matthew 25, 46, and you'll see that there's only two choices at the end of this life, heaven or hell. Reject this verse and others like it, and you'll find yourself adrift into all different kinds of heresy, which, by the way, take you off of the spot of responsibility and accountability for your life. You see, if you and I think that we just ultimately end up going to sleep and there's no consequence, no afterlife, no eternity involved with our existence, I promise you, you would live a very different life down here. Know that there are only two destinations. You're either going to heaven or you are going to hell. And I'll tell you what, you get a little uncomfortable. And if you know you're going to heaven because you've been captured by grace, it will give you a sense of urgency and a fire in your belly to be a sharer of that grace and this good news. Reject it. You just keep doing what you're doing. No sweat, no urgency, no issue, no responsibility, no accountability, no consequence. Take a look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and here you'll learn the gospel. You'll see that being saved is all of grace, all of faith, with a purpose of works. That you and I can only be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, evidenced by our living out that mission of service. Take a look at Galatians 5, through 24, and you'll see that where the root of Christ is, the fruit of the Spirit will permeate and that you'll see what the portrait of a believer is in terms of the characteristics of our lives, that we will have the very essence and presence of the Spirit of God in us, and that His characteristics become ours, that we live predominantly as a portrait of love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth, that you begin to look like Jesus wherever you go, and by your witness, He is drawn. He's drawing others to Himself. Don't know that, and then how you live isn't, isn't really an issue. What you look like won't matter. Know this truth, and it will shape who you become. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, and here again you see the gospel. This is my favorite portrayal of the gospel. Let me read it to you. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these are, all these things are from God who reconciles us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the very righteousness of God in him. If you understand that passage and God has supernaturally made that truth a part of who you are, you cannot live unchanged. You cannot. Now, there are many who say they get it and live unchanged. And I'm telling you, this is why a day like today is so important. Because when you hear what God has said and you take a look at the reality of one's life, our own or others, and what they say and what God says do not go together, I tell you, they are not together. This is why we trust his word instead of what the world will say and tell us. Take a look at Proverbs 12, 21, and it'll show you the Christian's eternal confidence and perspective. No harm befalls the righteous, but the wicked are filled with trouble or evil. You see, this is based on the eternal stage. It doesn't mean that Christians don't have hard times. What it means is that no matter what happens down here, it doesn't really matter when we get to eternity. That you may go through some struggle and strife for 50 or 100 years down here, big deal. That's not even a blip on the screen when you start talking about billions of years just getting started. 
Oh, what an amazing thing happens when we get God's perspective in our priorities. Take a look at Ephesians 4, 14 through 16. This is one of the passages that for me is a signature on my ministry and I pray yours as well. And this is where God says, when you know truth in love, it is the answer to the destabilizing and unsettling issues of the deceivers and the storms and the challenges of life. What do you need? I can tell you all the time. You need Jesus and you need his truth in love. It is the universal answer to everything. You need Jesus and you need to apply his truth and love to your circumstance. You need to gospel that. Whatever the situation is, you need to gospel it and you'll be good to go. Don't get that and I'll tell you what, your life is gonna be a train wreck and you're just gonna go from hopping one set of tracks to hopping another. It's just a matter of time and it's about commiserating and managing your misery in between wrecks. Know this truth, and you've been set free, right? And if somebody blows up your tracks and the train tips over, you're a happy train tipped over. You can have peace in the storm. This is the reality of God's word. I pray that you see why it's so important that you understand this. Because if you get this wrong and you get caught up into the rumors of false gospels or or empty religion, or perhaps worse, the evil desires to intentionally deceive and take people away, It's the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between joy and despair down here. Take a look at Galatians 1, 6 through 9, and this closes out my section on what you need to learn. This is where God's word says that if anybody comes to you with another gospel, another form of good news, they are to be damned. That's what God's word says twice. In verses 6, and nine of chapter one of Galatians. Paul says, listen, even if we come back, if you think it's me, if we actually come back and we change things, then we're to be damned because this is the truth. It's the truth, it's not the teller that tests the truth telling. Oh, this is such an important thing. This is why I encourage you in our church, right? Don't trust it because I tell you, trust it because it's God's word. Anything you hear from me or anybody else, you bring back to God's word in full context because he is the ultimate judge and it's his gospel that saves and nothing else. So here, the first leg of our stool, this needs to be learned so that you're not blown around by the winds of deception or despair. 10 aspects of God's love 1 John 3.16, Jesus defines and shows us true love. God's word, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is biblical love and it's contrasted to lust and like in this world. This is not a hallmark love, this is a holy love. This is what Jesus said. You wanna know love? It's sacrificial love pouring out the best for the other, no matter what. Well, no, I don't know about that, no matter what. How about the cross? How about to the point of torturous death? That's what he says, this is love. Oh, if we would only understand biblical love instead of this world of lust and like, the cheap, perverted imitations, do you think it might make a difference? 1 John 3, 18, let us not love with word and tongue, but in action and in truth. What if this was not only the definition of the love, it was actually a verb? You think that might make a difference? I tell you, it was God's plan. That's exactly what Jesus said. This is what we are to be. If you don't embrace these, you start walking around treating lust like love. You don't engage 1 John 3, 18, and you all of a sudden think that it's what your lips do that matter. It doesn't matter what your life does. And you end up with all the hypocrisy that you see in this world, especially in and around and through the church. This is DNA defining important, these issues. Look at John 3, 16 to see the most popular and famous verse in all the Bible. You see the sacrificial love of God, right? You ignore that verse or don't understand it and you think all God is is this big, angry, autocratic dictator in the sky. Nothing could be further from the truth. He is creator God and he's crucified God. And the love of God matched with the holiness of God and the justice of God and so many other of his beautiful attributes are needed to be seen to rightly understand. 
To lose sight of the fact that the God of creation and the God of the cross is a loving God is to not know him at all. Take a look at Mark 12, 30 and 31. You see what we know is the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Do you think that's important? Do you think he meant it? He said it was the most important of all the commands. And he went to the cross to verify it. If we minimize that, we ignore it, we pervert it, we twist it, right? We step over it. We say, well, I know it. I don't have to live it. Does that matter? I know in part that I'm not celebrating my mom's birthday today because that truth was lost. Just that one truth. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you won't make the decisions that take you where some end up tragically. Now, it's not to say that we can't stumble. And I personally, I pray to God my mom stumbled. But I don't have any confidence in that. In part because the consistency and the pattern of life did not reflect what we're talking about today. And that's the only measure that matters. It's the measure given by the Messiah that matters. Not what we say, not what the world says, not what a church placates to its people. It's God and his word. Read Matthew 25, 40, where Jesus said that what you did and didn't do for the least of these, you did or didn't do for me. Do you think it matters how we treat the least of these around us? Ignore this passage, this verse, ignore it, and you won't. It's no big deal. Hey, you know, there's a ton of people somebody else will help. No, no, we don't walk by. We've been called to love people like Jesus loves people. This is at the essence of what it is to be Christ and Christ-like. Read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and you'll see the portrait of what love is. And I'll tell you what, friends, especially if you're married, That's a wonderful place to go on a very regular basis so that you don't take those that you claim to love for granted and that you try every day to live out God's portrait of love with those that you claim to love. I ask you, is that important? I promise you it'll impact your relationships. Take a look at John 17, 20 through 21, and you'll see what the role of unity is and how love is expressed in koinonia, in a supernatural oneness amongst God and his people. Read that passage, and you'll come to understand that it's not only about your quality of life and your witness in a way that you like, but it's the very glory of God that's at stake as to whether or not you understand and embrace the love in the unity in the koinonia. Jesus said, as he prayed to God the Father for the church, oh, that they would have that same oneness with one another that we have, Father, and that that oneness will be shared with us so that the world will know that you sent me. He says that the love and the unity of the body of Christ is his calling card. How important is our witness? Are we just gathered together for us? Or are we here to bring glory to God and by being his salt and his light? Well, our salt quality and our light quality is directly related to our love and our unity per God. That's what Jesus said in his high priestly prayer for us. Friends, please do not be satisfied with superficial relationships within the body of Christ. There is perhaps no greater effacement to the faith than superficial, hypocritical relationships. That's what you have to walk away with when you read John 17, 20, and 21. Read John 14, 15, and all of a sudden you realize that to love God is to obey God. And all the wiggle room for faithful obedience just got sucked out of the room. That verse says that either you love him and obey him, or you disobey him and in so doing show that you don't really love him. I'll tell you what, when the pattern of one's life shows blatant disobedience for God, then the pattern of one's life shows a lack of love for God. And a lack of love for God excludes somebody from the family of God. Now that's the truth. 
You want to talk about sucking the air out of a room, right? You, you bring that one to the cookout. Watch what happens. But this is God's word. Do you want to go to the cookout or do you want to go to Christ? Do you want them to go to the cookout or do you want them to come to Christ? These are the truths that define the biblical worldview. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Does it matter that we're in conversation and dialogue with God? I tell you, it does all the time. Psalm 23, read it to recognize the peace that comes from knowing that you are loved by the Good Shepherd. Read Psalm 23 to understand the proper posture in the midst of the challenges of life. To not do so is to leave you adrift in the midst of the wind and the struggle. Okay, that's love. Let's close out our time together looking at what it is to live this relationship with Christ, to take God's word on how we're to live. And I bring you first to Acts 1.8, the verse upon which this church was built, that we are called to be Holy Spirit-empowered witnesses locally, regionally, and to the ends of the earth. Say that you'll pick one instead of all three or two instead of all three, and it's like taking one or two legs off of your three-legged stool. Tell me how that works for you. This is what God said. He said, you will be empowered for it, and this is the design. Now go follow me. If that matters, these things matter. Take a look at John 17, 17. God grows his children and sanctifies us through the truth of his word. That's what he says. How important is God's word? Do you live in a healthy relationship with God's word? It's his refining tool. Tell me that you don't spend much time in God's word and I'll tell you that you are avoiding his primary means of changing, growing, and refining you. Is that important to you? I promise you it is if you're a biblical believer. And if it isn't, then I encourage you to check your heart. It's to say that I love him, I just don't want him actively working in my life. He's not a fire extinguisher. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Again, see this prayer because this will actually help you along the way, all the way through. Take a look at 1 John 2, 6. Anyone who claims to be in Christ must walk as Jesus walked. Again, does faithful obedience matter? Only if authenticity is important to you. If not, don't sweat it. Embrace hypocrisy, walk however you want. Authenticity important to you, then you must walk as Jesus walked. That's what his word says. That's the pattern of our lives. That's the pattern of a life that is committed to Christ. Do we stumble? Yes. Me bigger and perhaps more than you. It's not about never stumbling and being perfect. It's about the pattern and the passions of our lives. Take a look at Matthew 10, 16. You're to be as shrewd as a serpent and as gentle and as innocent as a dove because you're being sent out as sheep amongst wolves. Are wolves real? You better believe it. You're being sent to them, lamb. So what do you do? You'd be as shrewd as a serpent and as innocent as a dove. Perhaps the greatest both and verse in all the Bible. Romans 12, 12 is a Christian calibration and it's an attitude adjustment. How are we to walk through the life? Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction and faithful in prayer. That's a wonderful way to live, friends. And it's straight from God's word. And have you noticed that'll help no matter what, no matter where you are. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. You find yourself on some crooked roads? Don't lean on your logic. Don't lean on yourself. Go to him. Father, show me. Speak to me through your word, through our prayers, through other believers, and maybe even through circumstance. But Lord, I want to hear you. I want your ways, not my ways. Read John 13, 35 to see once again this call to supernatural unity, that it's by our love for one another that the world will know that we're Christians. Does that matter? Does the love for one another, not the proximity, hey, I'm willing to sit three feet away from that person. That's not love. Love is love. Do we really love each other? Are you willing to sacrifice for that love? Are you willing to lay down your personal wants in a worshipful way to walk with Christ by loving his bride and those around us. John 7, 24, I would say to you, this is probably the most misquoted in all the Bible. Don't you go judge. Judge not lest you be judged, right? Wrong. That's being taken out of context. 
You are called to judge. You are commanded to judge. You're just not supposed to judge unrighteously or superficially. That entire passage, Matthew 7, starts off with judge not, but it continues and it tells the story. It says don't be one who's got a plank in your own eye and you're busy taking the speck out of somebody else's. It says get the plank out of your eye, then go help them get the speck out of theirs. Ultimately, in Matthew 7, 24, it says, do not judge superficially, but judge righteously. You're called to judge. You need to live with discernment. That's the essence of judging. Righteous judging is biblical discernment. Friends, you must judge righteously all day, every day. Take a look at Philippians 4, 12. To understand that Christianity brings a contentedness. Paul says, listen, I've learned to be content in all circumstances. Friends, I pray that you will live with a sense of contentedness in Christ. This is the essence of what it is to be Christian. Galatians 2.20 says, in that contentedness comes a personal crucifixion. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Right? Is crucifixion a part of your contentedness? I pray that it is because this is what God says. Take a look at 9.23. Not only is crucifixion a part of the contentedness, then you pick up your cross and follow. So there's cross carrying and crucifixion wrapped up in contentedness in Christ. Say, well, that's not very appealing. It is for a child of God because it's not about me, it's about him. And my life is not here to bring glory to me, but glory to him. And the grace that he gives me, he gives me to make known his glory If that sounds foreign to you, then I fear that you may not know the faith that is inherent in the gospel of Jesus Christ because this is his truth. And I say this to you so that you can go and look and see and pray and be and do the same with others that God will put into your life. Take a look at Ephesians 6.10 and realize that you've been called to live in the full armor of God. Ignore the truth of this passage and you'll think you live in Disney World and you'll get crushed You'll be a prisoner of war that's happy in the POW camp. Or you just might get slaughtered spiritually. You need to know that we live in a bloodbath, a spiritual war all the time. Read 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and you'll know that believers are called to test themselves to see whether or not they are in the faith and not to do a a kind of a, hey, I think I'm good. Do you think I'm good? Oh, I think you're good. I think you're good too. Well, not only that, you're also a very well-dressed person. I think you, and I, I think you have a wonderful bubbly personality. Oh, great. I'm good. You're good. You're good. I'm good. Okay, we're fine. No, he says, bring yourself to my word. Bring yourself to what I've shown you and ask yourself, am I a Christian? I pray to God that all of us will do this and regularly bring ourselves back to the litmus test of truth. And friends, it's not always to see whether or not you're a Christian. It will be, if you are a Christian, to get back into healthy stead and say, Lord, refine this sin out of me. Forgive me as I repent. But I want to keep coming back and putting myself under the filter of your truth and your love. Read Ezekiel 33, and you'll see that you have a responsibility as a wall walker and that if you choose to ignore that responsibility, the blood of those that are lost will be on you on Judgment Day. I tell you what, that's a very sobering passage, and far too many walk away or stay away from it or ignore its reality, but I'll tell you this, that if you know the Lord and you stand silent or you become self-consumed and you ignore the responsibility to be an ambassador of Christ and one who goes fishing for men, a winner of souls, then you will answer one day for that as those that you stood silent before die and go to hell, God says that the blood of those people will be accounted to us. I pray to God you show up and stand before the Lord one day with clean hands. Take a look at 2 Peter 1.3, Philippians 4.13, similar passages. It eliminates all excuses. You can do all things in Christ who gives you strength. If he's called you to it, he'll equip you for it. He'll empower it. 2 Peter 1.3, you've received everything you need for life and godliness. You can do everything that he's called and created you to do. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you and I have been called to be salt and light. He says if you claim to be salt and you lose your saltiness, you're not even going to be of use to him in the dung pile. He literally says if you claim to be salt and you have no saltiness, you'll ruin my crap. That's what he says. 
I can't even put you in the manure pile because you'll ruin the fertilizing capacity of the manure. Friends, is it important that you and I that claim to be salt and light are actually salty lights? Jesus says, you better believe it. Take a look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. Ignore the truth of this passage and you'll stay in a cocoon, self-absorbed, and not focus on the very essence of why we are here. He said, you bring me glory by bringing my grace and the gospel to those who desperately need it. Can you imagine one day saying, hey, hi, Lord, I'm here. I'm so glad to be home. I couldn't wait to get here. And he says, "Uh, I gave you one overarching responsibility. You didn't make a single disciple. You didn't personally go. Yeah, what makes you think this is home? Because if I were dad and you were child, you would have obeyed. In fact, I'm master and those that claim to be mine are slave. So you're going to show up here having totally disobeyed, ignored what I said, and you think I'm supposed to welcome you home like this is going to be great? Away from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. No, 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 no. I was on the committee for this, and I did that, and I learned Greek, and I was a pastor, and I taught a Sunday school. Yeah, away from me, you evildoer. I gave you one overarching mission and command and you thought well i can ignore that one because i'll just get busy enough being good in my own way i'm sure he'll accept that at the end friends we ignore minimize or accept a rumored version of the great commission and i tell you that's a damnable error because it represents a heart that is not committed to christ read acts 20 24 and you'll see that paul says listen my life was nothing to me Living this out is to put yourself in the place of nothingness. That's the essence of dying to self. That's picking up your cross. Saying, I'm all about Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for rescuing me. Titus 1, 10 through 13, you're going to have direct confrontation, and it's going to be hard. And the Lord is going to use you at times to tell somebody you are wrong and you must stop because you are hurting others. Say, well, what if that's not received well? Well, he goes on and he says, then you must rebuke them sharply because they must be silenced for they are destroying entire households. Friends, living this walk with God will involve you being a confrontational Christian at times. Hebrews 13, 17, this is where we're called to obey and submit to the leaders of our church. Friends, I put that in there because if you ignore this passage, you'll think that you get to run the church. And listen, The reality is that God has, in the context of church, sheep and shepherds. And the sheep are to submit to the shepherds to the extent that the shepherds submit to the great shepherd. That's God's order of things. And in our context today, in much the same way that biblical submission of wives to their husbands has been perverted, so has the understanding of how the church is to be run. There are under shepherds who have a responsibility to lead and feed the sheep that are the church, and the sheep have the responsibility to follow the lead of their under-shepherds, even to the point of making their lives as under-shepherds joyful. God's word actually says that, that the sheep have a responsibility to make the responsibility of the under-shepherds a joy to fulfill. Take a look at Daniel 3. You see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here's the no matter what clause. You understand what God has said and you'll say it doesn't matter if the furnace is roaring or not. It doesn't matter if we burn up in the furnace or not. We will stand and not bow to the ways of this world no matter what. And if our God chooses to save us from the furnace, amen. And if he doesn't, amen. We are not bowing down to this world. Ignore that passage in these three boys and you'll rationalize cowardice. You'll rationalize away disobedience. You'll rash, well, you got to understand. No, I don't. I need to proclaim, and so do you, the word of God. Luke 10, 5, and 6, you'll recognize that yours and my call is to go seek out the persons of peace. We live to find those persons of peace that we can pour God's truth and love into, that God would use them to expand his kingdom and draw more adoptions into the family of God. 
ignore that and you'll get busy doing some kind of activity that makes you feel good or the church will do activities that are designed to look good instead of just saying God has laid out the strategy. Here it is. This is what he said to do. Let's just do it. Two more. Hebrews 12.1 Christians commit to God's best and not just human good. You see in Hebrews 12, we're told at the very beginning that we're to lay down those things that may be good but hinder our commitment to God's best. So we're not only called to lay down our sin, but we're called to lay down the good that gets in the way of God in our lives. And I tell you, friends, this is a challenging place because we rationalize a lot of good in the place of God. And God's word makes it very clear. You don't just lay down the sin. You lay down anything that hinders holiness and full commitment to Christ. Think about the damage of ignoring that or rationalizing that passage away does. Finally, 2 Timothy 2.2. God's word says that what has been entrusted to you in this truth and love in the gospel, you are to impart into others who are worthy and are willing to impart it into others who will in turn impart it into others. This is the great missionary call, that you are to be a disciple who makes disciples who makes disciples. And in so doing, the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ will spread across this world. That was the plan of God. That's what Jesus started. And that's what you and I are commissioned to do and to be even now today. And I pray to God that all of us will embrace this. What's at stake? The difference between really getting it right or just kind of getting in the ballpark? Friends, truth begets trust. And where there is no truth, there cannot be healthy trust. And the essence of a healthy relationship with Jesus the Christ is to trust him and the grace that he has given and that our trust and our faith will be in him to the point where it radically reorganizes and transforms our lives supernaturally. To lose the truth is to lose the ability to trust biblically. And you and I have been called as ambassadors of Christ to be ambassadors of truth so that we may be a bridge across which trust is developed between person A and Jesus the Christ. This is what is at stake. Listen to 2 Corinthians 2.15. I think it wraps all of this together. You, as a Christian, have been called to be the aroma of Christ in a world filled with stench of sin. God's word. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Friends, my prayer is that you will not be distracted, that you will not be discouraged, that you will not be deceived by any form of rumor that may spread among the believers that is inconsistent with what Jesus really said and meant. Let us be the aroma of Christ together and to those in our Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, ends of the earth, let us be great commission, bouquets, believers, who are, who will be the aroma of Christ, that we will learn what we need to learn, that we will love in Christ-like love, and that we will live on mission for our Messiah, miraculously empowered by his Spirit. Would you pray with me? Lord, I come to you this morning, and I thank you so much for the truth of your word that None of us ever have to be adrift again. None of us have to be in that place of doubt or despair. And that those that you put into our lives, by putting us in their lives and filling us with your truth and love, 
that you have created a connection, a great commission connection from Christ to the Christian, to those who need Christ. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be your bridge. Thank you for extending us as bridges across our community, across our county, across our country, and across the continents. Oh, Lord Jesus, what a blessed people we are to be your ambassador to our neighbors and to the nations. Let us embrace a healthy understanding of who you are, what you have said, and who you have called and created and commissioned us to be. No more, no less, no matter what, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well.